Well, good morning. We're going to conclude chapter 8 today of the book of Romans. And I think just a recap. Perhaps we can turn the volume down a bit. Sounds a bit boomy. Okay. Yeah, the book of Romans is, is quite unique in the scriptures. I like to look at it as the technical book on our salvation. Uh, there's lots of passages that, that speak about it, but there's no book that quite describes uh, the mechanics of how we have been made righteous before God. And it's quite obvious that we see that it is the Lord that makes us that way. But you know, in, in a sense, you know, this book, if I can describe it as a piece of music, you know, in music there's crescendos and, uh, what's, what's the right word, decrementos? Decrescendos. Thank you, Jill. I knew I could rely on the musicians here to correct my, uh, my Italian. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in books in the Bible, there's crescendos in a sense of truth. And I think this is one of the points in this book of Romans where we see Paul is leading up to a very, very important point here. Now, let's see what's leading up to that. At the beginning of the book, we saw how Paul laid out the fact that mankind in his natural state is utterly corrupt, utterly apart from God. He's lost. And worst of all, he is condemned. He's com- condemned to eternal separation from God, both the pagan as well as the Jew, even though the Jew has had a, a heritage of knowing God, even the Jew himself is proven to be condemned before God. But Paul brought out another truth. This whole idea of justification, that mankind can be made right before God, but it's by faith. And it was by faith apart from works. It was faith apart from the law, as was illustrated in Abraham. And then the introduction of this idea of sanctification, being set apart for the use by which we were created. We were created to serve God. We were created to uh, illuminate His character in the creation. And He has done that with our union through Christ. Our union through His death and resurrection. The death to the old nature and the resurrection into the new life. And that new life is powered by the work of the Spirit. It is no longer powered by self-effort. And as we move into chapter 8, it points the way to glorification where the Lord will take us to the point when we will be perfected in the way that God intended us to be. I just want to close off this, uh, this chapter by looking at some questions that Paul talked about in the last few verses here. I guess in the case of the church, it's the last few weeks or the last few months. Just as a bit of a quick review, uh, let us consider some of the last questions in, in this chapter. Verse 33 says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who is he who condemns? And the question that we're going to look to today, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Okay? And Paul is asking these questions to the readers to really get them to consider. Look at what we have studied. Look at the truths that are in God's Word. Now consider this before you. If there's any doubt in your mind, consider these questions. We see... Who shall lay any charge against God's elect? Well, it's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ, who died and rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father, and he is the one who intercedes for us. He's on our side. And today we're going to look at who is he Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, if I can ask these three questions, 
sort of taking God out of the out of the equation here and thinking of it, could there be anybody else that could uh, have any power over these questions? When we ask these three questions, who shall lay any charge against God's elect? I could say no one. Who is it that condemns us? No one. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Again, I will say, no one. And these are the encouraging words in this closing of this chapter. Who shall separate us from the love of God? As Paul introduces this idea, and we'll read it in a minute, would dire circumstances be evidence that God himself, say, has forsaken us? No, because it's through these things that God sanctifies us. But even more than that, there is nothing even supernatural, as Paul will describe, that can come between us and God. Now let's read these passages. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril, or sword, as it is written. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for great men, such as the Apostle Paul, who considered himself the least of all apostles. But yet, Father, we have his letters that you inspired, written to the churches, and we are a church today. We are part of the body of Christ and the messages that are written in these letters apply to us today as much as they did almost 2,000 years ago, Father. And we just trust that it is your truth that we are hearing. And Father, may we apply this truth to our life and, and build up ourselves. And it's you who's building us up, Lord, to be the creation that you want us to be. The creation that you destined us to be to be formed, transformed in the likeness of your Son. And Father, in these passages, we see your steadfast love. And Father, may we be encouraged by these words. We thank you in his name. Amen. Okay. Now, first part I want to look at is an idea is, I think Paul is trying to get across to the readers, and that is this. Has God forsaken you? You know, Paul having told the believers all these great things, but yet in our life, there are times that we find troublesome, aren't there? What is happening here? Are the believers undergoing certain circumstances? Are they facing tribulations? Okay. Is there trouble in your life? Is there trouble? Okay. Distress. Okay. Um, I can't remember the other word that used to describe distress. It's quite a common word. It's not danger. It's, uh, I can't remember. You can, you can look it up. But is there distress in your life? How about persecution? Are there those in your life that uh, give you a hard time because of your faith? You know, perhaps uh, they, they snicker behind your back or they exclude you from things. Or perhaps they come right into your face and uh, degrade you because you're a Christian. How about famine or hunger? Is there hunger? And now we live in a society where maybe this doesn't happen too often, but think about our uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord around the world. I'm sure many of them go through hunger because of their faith. Um... If you remember, we talked about a fella in Guinea uh, who became a Christian. And what happened in that culture is because he became a Christian, he became ostracized from his uh, Muslim family. And so he essentially was cut off. 
there was no uh, means of support for him. So we raised money to try to help uh, believers like this. Okay? Or nakedness. The same principle can happen in the case I just gave you. Or peril. Have you ever been in danger as a Christian? Or have you ever been uh, faced with a sword? Again, we know, especially in this last hundred years, some have said that there has been more Christians martyred than in any other age combined. Okay? Maybe they don't use a sword nowadays, although we have seen uh, scenes from the Middle East that come over the news where a sword has definitely been used to kill people. But a lot of times it's done more efficiently with guns. Okay? Now, if someone is a Christian and you're experiencing these types of things, would you not think or would you not wonder, God, have you turned your back on me? Why are you doing these things? Where are you, God? And I wonder if this is what Paul is trying to address. He quotes from a psalm. And I want to read the psalm to you. Because I think in order to appreciate what Paul is trying to get to, let us go to the psalm. It's Psalm 44. You can read along with me if you'd like. And I'll just read it. And it kind of breaks up into two, three parts. It starts off by saying, We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand. And by them you planted, that is, his people, our ancestors. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain the possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. And again, he's talking about the people he planted there, the ancestors. But it is your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall I, my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. And here the psalmist is looking back at the great uh, heritage that the nation of Israel has had, saying, look what our God has done for us, and we know it wasn't our might that did it, it was God that did, us for, did it for us. God looked out for us, he went ahead with our armies, and he fought for us. Verse 9, something's happened. But you have cast us off and put us to shame, and you do not go out with our armies. You make us turn back from the enemy, and those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves. You have given us up like sheep intended for food, and have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing, and you are enriched, are not enriched by selling them. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those all around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the heads among the people. My dishonor is continually before me, and the shame of my face has covered me because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles, because of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way, but you have severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we have forgotten the name of our Lord or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secret of the heart. Yet for our, your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Do you see why Paul puts that passage in there now? We are Christians. We trusted in you, Lord. And we know that you are the one that saved us. We know that you are the ruler of the entire universe. But Father, why are, why are these horrible things happening to us? Are you there, Lord? Have, have we hurt you? Have you forgotten us? Have we done something that you will not look at us? Why do you hide your face? And this is how the psalmist continues. He pleads, awake. 
Why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. And the question I give to you this morning, as a Christian, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like that? Do you feel as the psalmist writes, God, do you love me anymore? Do you love me? There's a reason these things are happening. I want, you to, I want us to consider a couple other passages this morning, and I am going to take you through quite a few passages this morning. First, if you will, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 27. Paul is defending his steadfastness as an apostle of Christ. I'm going to pick it up halfway through verse 23. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Talk about being in danger and peril. Hmm. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robberies, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. I often wonder if Paul wrote those particular words in that passage because he was describing his own life as one who was fervently dedicated to God and Christ and one who is firmly persuaded that God loves him. If you're not convinced, we can go back to another passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 4 we read, But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonment, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of His righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, by deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened, chastened and yet not killed, by sorrowful, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Paul is trying to get the point across that when you feel these things happening to you, and you think that your troubles in life are unusual and that somehow God has forgotten to you, Paul is trying to look and say, hey, this is part of the Christian life. You know, don't expect it to be all easy because Paul is looking at his, at his own life as an example of what can happen to you when you live the sufferings of the Lord. Okay? Now, that may sound like an awful thing. Boy, this is, Christian life is tough. This is tough. I don't, I don't know if I want to go through this. But Paul gives the encouraging words. Yeah, these things come upon you and I don't want you to be discouraged like the psalmist was because it's through these things that we become more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. The fact that you're going through this time of trouble and and difficulty 
is not that the Lord is punishing you. It's not that the Lord has forsaken you or left you or doesn't love you anymore. He loves you. And he loves you so much that he wants to transform you into the likeness of his son, right? This is part of the entire message we've been looking at. The point is, it's through these things that he accomplishes this end. Okay? Words of encouragement in times of trouble. Okay? So, has God forsaken us? You know, you can write the big words in your, in your book here. No, he has not. He has not forsaken you. We remember in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, for to those who are called according to His purpose. And we know that His purpose is to make you in the likeness of His Son. Okay? That's the purpose. Often it's been said, you know, we may scream, oh, God, wh why are you doing this to me? The answer is because he's transforming us into the likeness of his son. Okay? How this is working, well, maybe that's a different question. But the point is, it is the Lord's work. Romans 8 and 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see, this kind of ties into what Paul has said in today's passage, that you will be more than just conquerors. You know, the benefit that will come out of this uh, life that we go through is just uncomparable. It's going to be wonderful. And almost in a sense, some would say, well, we'll almost forget about this life. You know, you, we think, well... What's an example of where God interacts and causes what we think at the time is harm but brings out greater good? You know, one simple one that happened in a corporate sense was at Jerusalem. All the Christians were there at first at Jerusalem. And what was God's command to the Christians at Jerusalem? Go into all the world and spread the gospel. But they didn't. And they were quite comfortable being with one another. So God sent persecution amongst the Christians. And what did he do? By that, he scattered them. Okay? He gave them that little nudge out of the nest that they needed to have in order to create a greater purpose for God. Right? A greater good. God's doing the same thing in your life, in my life. Okay? There is victory that we get through working through the Lord Jesus Christ. Just quickly, 1 John 5, verses 3 and 4. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, as this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Okay? So it's all part of God's purpose, and through this we will be conquerors, we will get a great victory. Okay? Now what has happened? Again, we're running out of time, because I picked too many passages here. They, they take time to read. James chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Actually, just uh, verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You know, I've heard of, uh, I think Mark, you've often used this, uh, this example. You know, if you can pray for patience, but unless a situation arises on which you can exercise yourself to overcome that patience, you'll never have the opportunity to exercise it, right? Because if everybody was wonderful and everybody was nice to you, how would you ever know that you were impatient? Right? I remember uh, one other fellow said, you know, never pray for patience because the moment you do, God will send an imbecile your way. Right? Because it's not that God's just going to drop patience into you. He's going to make you work it out. Okay? Now, I'm sorry, i got one more long passage that we have to read together. Okay? I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because in this passage, 
it really needs, leads into the next part we want to look at. Chapter 4, verses 6 down to 18. For it is the God who commands light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, what he's talking about there is the fact, as we've seen in this chapter just a few months ago, that it is the Holy Spirit that is in us that gives us the power to change us in in that sense. God created us to reflect his glory, to reflect his moral character. And we've seen that when we just try to do it by following the law, we fail time and time again. How has God made this perfect? He's done it because He has put His Spirit in us. This earthen vessel. The Holy Spirit resides in this earthen vessel. And in order for this Spirit within this earthen vessel to shine out for others to see, the earthen vessel has to be taken apart bit by bit, to let the brightness and the light of the Spirit shine through. Okay? We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. You see, sometimes we go through trials and trouble and persecution is because what the Lord is trying to do is to take this old body that we were born with and to kill it every day. Every day. To take it out of the way. Why? So that the life of Christ may become more evident and more evident and more evident. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise up us up with Jesus and will present us with you. How far am I reading here? Till verse 18. For all things are for your sake, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet inward man is being renewed day by day. And here Paul brings up this idea again. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Those last two verses are very important for, for I believe, where Paul takes us next. So are we all clear on the fact That the persecution, the trouble, the difficulty that we go through is not to be looked on with despair. We are not to think that the Lord has forsaken us or He's uh, just walking away. He doesn't love us anymore. Quite the opposite. He's using these things to perfect us for His purpose. Now, the things that Paul mentioned in that first list in verse 35, are the temporal things that he mentioned. The things that he was experiencing, that we're experiencing. The persecution, the hunger, the nakedness, the danger, the difficulty, the trials. Those are the temporary things. They're temporary. They're light afflictions, as he calls them. 
I know that sounds easy to say, right? Nothing seems light when you're going through some of this difficulty. But yet, he talks about another list of things that he believes will not separate us from the love of God. The fact that we are experiencing these difficulties is the evidence that God truly loves us, not disloves us. But even so, there is nothing else that will be ever be able to come and separate us from the love of God. And I think there is order in the list that he gives. He says, There is neither death nor life. Why does death come first there? I mean, I'm alive now, but I'm going to die later. But he says death nor life. The life that we live now is the temporal. It's the time of light of fiction. But there's going to come a time when we will leave this earth, and so we will be separated from this earth, and we will die, and there will be another life. And so what Paul is saying is not, nothing through death or in that next life, nor is there anything of the spiritual authorities in their power, and that's why he mentions the angels or the messengers, the principalities and powers, and we know that principalities and powers are different ranks of angels, and I believe that when Paul mentions these angels and powers and principalities, he's talking about the opposing supernatural beings that have allied himself themselves with Satan. So he says there's anything through death or in the next life, there's nothing in there that's going to separate us from the life of God. All these supernatural beings out there, there's nothing they can ever do to separate us from the life, love of God. There's nothing in this present age or in the next age when the Lord returns. You know, just a little aside here, I've, I've often wondered this. You know, and maybe you've thought this too. You know, you think of, say, Adam and Eve... And, and, you know, they, were, they dealt with God in a certain way. Then something else came. And then, you know, we look at the nation of Israel. And God dealt with the nation of Israel with a certain covenant in a certain way. And they thought everything was fine. But something else happened. They didn't see, in a sense, the way we do, the new covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, maybe some are thinking, well, in this new world, in this new age that's going to come... Maybe the ground rules are going to be all different again and we're going to have to relearn something else in order to be at one with God again. Well, I think I thank Paul that he's written what he's written here because he says nothing in this age or in the next age to come is going to change anything. Our relationship with the Lord will be solid. Nor height nor depth. And that's from the highest elevations in the heavenly realms to the deepest part of the abyss and death, nor any other creature that we have no idea about, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ our Lord. Now I think those are very, very comforting words. Now if I can sum it up this way, and it's an encouragement to me and I hope it's an encouragement to you, that God loves us. With all the truths that we've discovered so far in the book of Romans, we see what God has done for us, how we've been justified, made right before God. And you know, when you think of justification, it's just that door that leads us into so much more of what God has for us. You know, in hard times, God is still with us. And he uses those hard times to make us more like his son. And there's nothing physical or spiritual in this world or the next that's going to stop that. Just one last passage before we close. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know that whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Okay? God says he's going to make me like his son. Okay? 
And He loves me. He has not forsaken me when hard times come upon my life, when there's trial and difficulty. No, by no means, it's not true that He's forsaken me. In fact, these things He's using to transform me. And nothing, absolutely nothing, is going to stop that. 